What is the meaning of life? God, we should remember that he created us in his image. The Lord, he created us in his likeness. For what? Someone may ask, why did God plant me in this field that is our world? The Lord, he tells us in the first chapter of Genesis that he created us to be holy. He created us to be righteous. The Lord, he created us to be fruitful. The Lord, he created us to multiply. In other words, I would say to all of you today that the Lord, our God, he desires for all of us to live a life of meaning. The Lord, he desires of all of us to live a life of purpose. And so I suppose I would ask all of you that question today. Are you living a life of meaning? Are you living a life of purpose? Have you and are you being fruitful on your journey or as you are growing in the field that is our world? Now, there have been many that have sought to find out what is the meaning of life. Many have sought it out and many have come up empty. Many have lived a lifetime and they have never found the answer to what is the meaning of life. They haven't found the answer because I would tell you that they have searched in the wrong places. You see, the answer to what is the meaning of life, I want you to understand that it has not been hidden from mankind. The meaning of life, it has not been hidden away from anybody. You just have to search in the right place. And I tell you that when you search in the right place, it's not a difficult search at all. See, the meaning of life, it can be found through scripture. Through scripture, the Lord tells us very plainly what the meaning of life actually is and how we can go about living a fruitful, a meaningful, a purposeful life. We'll find in the book of Micah through the prophet Micah that the Lord, he simply tells us to do good. What is good according to the Lord? The Lord, he said that he requires of us to to be fair. He requires of us to do justly to one another. The Lord, he requires of us, said in the book of Micah, he requires of us to love mercy. He requires of us to walk humbly with him. I would say to you today that, again, when we live that way, we can fulfill the actual meaning of life. You see, the meaning of life is to uplift. The meaning of life is to help each other. Somebody say, well, what are we supposed to help each other in doing? I would tell you today that we are to help one another find contentment in the life that we are living. Do you understand what I mean by that? We are to help each other find peace with their life. We are to help each other find satisfaction in our life. We are to help each other find joy in our life. As I have said over the last four sermons, the Lord, he planted us in this world to bear holy and righteous fruit. When you eat of that fruit, you can find peace. You can find satisfaction. You can find joy. See, again, if we bear holy and righteous fruit in this world, I would tell you that all of us would live a life where we uplift all of those that are around us. I will tell you that all of us will live a meaningful life. All of us will live a life of purpose. All of us will have lived a fruitful life. Are you living a fruitful life today? This is again, a life that is lived out of love. 
Are you living a life of love today? See, the problem that many of us have in fulfilling the meaning of life according to the Lord is that many of us, we aren't growing from that seed that Christ sowed in the field. As we have seen, there are two types of seeds that have been sown in the field that is our world. That seed that was sown by Christ, we again know was the holy and the righteous seed. The other seed I tell you today is a seed that grows into a plant that is withered, a plant that is still withering today. It is growing because again, it is growing according to the nature of the devil. The devil sowed that seed. The tree that is growing as a righteous tree of God is a tree that is fruitful. It is a tree that is bearing holy and righteous fruit. As I stated in my sermon last week, those who are of sincere faith, those who live in total submission to the Lord, we again, we live a life to where we are helpful to all of those that are around us. We help to save those that are sick. And again, I want you to understand that we're not talking about being sick just physically. We're talking about sick spiritually. You and I who have grown from the seed sown by Christ, we can save those who are poor in spirit. We have the ability to cover a multitude of sins. All of us who have grown from that holy and that righteous seed, we have the fruit that can save. We, the sincere believers, we live a life, I tell you today, of purpose. We live a life where we can help to lead those that are lost in sin to finding Christ himself. And again, when they find Christ, and they follow Christ, they can be saved. Do you desire to live a life of meaning today? Mm -hmm. However, I, I say to you that there are many more that refuse to live this life. There are many more that don't live this life. Sadly, many fall into living in submission to the world mm -hmm. as they become obedient to their lust. They become obedient to their passions. They become obedience to the riches of this world. Those who live in this manner, they do so with the belief that if they gain the riches that are of this world, that they will be the ones that flourish. Many believe that if they gain the riches of this world, that they will be the ones that prosper. In this world to them, this is the meaning of life to them, gaining the world, gaining all of its riches. It's everything. It is life. It's what they wake up in the morning desiring to do. It's what they go to sleep at night still desiring to do to have the world in the palm of their hands. That is the meaning of life to them. Now, some of those are a very small minority that happen to live in submission to the world. They may actually be fortunate enough to gain some of the riches of this world. But what about the others? What about the rest? You see, I, I feel even more important I would ask, well, what can those riches do for the soul that the rest will go out and grind and they will hustle all their lives for? What can the riches of this world actually do for the soul? You see, this is the same question that Jesus, that he had asked himself. When, when Jesus, when, when he asked what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world, but then loses his soul. Jesus, I want you to understand, he was asking the question, why? Why do you want the riches of this world so badly 
when the riches of this world, it can't profit your soul. Why do so many of us want the riches of this world when it can't do anything for our soul? You see, I want you to understand today that life is about more than the riches of this world. Life is about more than the material gains. Do you understand what I mean by that? You see, life, I want you to understand, it's about the condition of your soul. Is your soul ready for the Lord? You see, I want you to understand today that we must focus on our soul because that is what is most important, our soul. Is your soul well or is your soul in poor health today? Now, when Jesus, when he asked that question, I want you to understand that he was talking on the subject about the meaning of life. And Jesus, he made that statement after speaking to the disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees. In other words, Jesus, he had been teaching about how defilement, how it comes from within, how it comes from the heart, how it comes from the soul. And so again, he was talking about one's soul, the condition of one's soul. You see, the Lord, he desires for our soul not to be in poor health. He desires for our soul to be in good health. That is what is most important to the Lord. And again, if it's important to the Lord, it should be important to all of us as well. And the meaning of life, it boils down to not simply finding happiness, because that's what everybody would say the meaning of life is. Finding happiness. I, I would say to you today that the meaning of life is finding contentment in your soul. You see, I want you to understand today that contentment in your soul is far greater than happiness. The happiness that can be brought on by anything that is of this world. Do you understand what I mean by that? You see, happiness that is of the world, as you have heard me say before, happiness that is of this world, it is temporary. It is temporary. The riches that are of this world, it can only give you temporary happiness. See, that's why so many people have to go back out and try to restore their happiness by the riches of this world. Whereas contentment in the soul Contentment, that is a blessing from the Lord. Contentment, it is long lasting. Contentment, it does not fade away. It does not go away like the happiness that is of this world. Find contentment and you find what is great for your soul. Contentment, again, it is long lasting peace. Contentment, again, it is long-lasting satisfaction. Contentment, it is long-lasting joy. Do you know how special that is today? If you knew how special it was today, then you would search for it. You would search for it. You would seek to find it in the right place. So I would ask all of you today, what are you doing to be content in your soul? What are you? Doing to be content, to find long lasting peace, to find long lasting joy in your soul. What are you doing to be content today? I would also ask you, what are you doing to help others find contentment as well? See, again, this is the meaning of life. Again, I want you to understand today. That if you are trying to find true contentment in your soul, you won't find it in the world. If you are looking for true contentment in your soul and you're trying to find it in the world, you are searching in the wrong place. That's why so many people come up empty when they say that they can't find happiness, when they say that they can't find joy. I tell you, they can't find it because they have looked in the wrong place. Solomon, I feel that he is the perfect person 
to use as an example for one in search for the meaning of life and coming up empty. The reason, again, why I say this is because Solomon, he was a man that had everything. Solomon didn't just have a little bit. Solomon, he had everything. And, and because he had everything, you would have thought that, that he would have been satisfied. You would have thought that he had found joy. You would have thought that he would have been content in his heart. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, I feel that I need to share with you Solomon's tragic story. I feel that we need to take a look at his search for the meaning of life today. Now, Solomon in his history, as he shares with us here in the second chapter of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, he started out with God. He started out with God from before he was even born to being promised by God to David to inherit David's throne. When David, when he desired to build the temple, the Lord said to him that it would not be for him to do because he had shed too much blood. However, it was promised to David that a son would be born to him and his son would be a man of rest. That son would be a man of peace and that that son would build a house for God's name. Mm -hmm. That was speaking of Solomon. Mm -hmm. Now, After David's death, there was, let's say, a civil war, an internal conflict that took place over his throne. And after the smoke and dust had cleared, after that internal conflict between the sons, Solomon, he was named king. Solomon, he became king of Israel at a very young age. And after he had become king, the Lord came to Solomon. And the Lord came to Solomon with a question, asking, what is it that I can give to you? You know, what would you what would you want from the Lord? If God came to you with that question and said, son, daughter, what is it that I can give you? What is it that you would desire from the Lord? Now, scripture tells us that Solomon, he didn't ask for a long life. That's what some of us would ask. Hey, I want to live forever. I don't want to live in this world forever. <laughs> I don't want no part of living. D, D shaking her head too. I don't want no part of living in this world forever. But hey, like I, you've heard me say before, some people love this world. Their eyes are on this world, and hey, they would they would ask, they would say to God, "Hey, yeah, give me long life. I want to live as long as I can." Solomon didn't ask for that. Solomon he didn't ask for riches for himself. You better believe that's the first thing that some of us would have been saying to God. Hey, yeah, make me rich. Oh, there'd have been plenty of prayers to God about, hey, make me rich. I want all the money in the world. There'd have been plenty of those kinds of prayers. Don't be ashamed if you done prayed it. I know you probably have. Solomon, he didn't even ask for the life of his enemies. Again, I tell you, some folks would certainly, that would certainly be some folks' prayers. Hey, that, that guy don't like me. Do something about it. Them folks, my enemies, do something about it, Lord. Solomon, he didn't ask. He didn't ask for those things. He didn't say, give me those things, Lord. Solomon, we are told in Scripture that all he asked for was to have an understanding heart to discern between good and evil. That's what Scripture tells us. We say that Solomon, all he prayed for was for wisdom. And so because Solomon had not asked for a long life, because he had not asked for the riches of this world, because he had not asked for the life of his enemies, but because he had asked to, to be able to discern between good and evil, the Lord said, it's yours. I give it to you. Again, as he tells us there from the third through the 10th verse, Solomon's reign, it started out great. Look at just how wealthy Solomon was there from the third through the 10th verse there. Solomon, he built and he had furnished the temple. With Israel no longer being at war with the Philistines, they, 
they began to, to prosper and they greatly prospered as well under his reign. And with Israel prospering, Solomon as the king, he prospered as well. Solomon, he had gained great wealth, is what he tells us there from the third through the tenth verse. Solomon's name, it had become so well known that other kings would visit him. And they would marvel at his kingdom. They would marvel at his wealth. They will marvel at, in other words, the materials. Mm -hmm. All that he had. Solomon, he was visited by the queen of Sheba. We know that visit very well. Where she had heard about him and all that he had done in the name of God, as shown to us in the 10th chapter of First Kings. The, the queen, she marveled and she praised the Lord for how blessed Solomon was, but not only how blessed he was, but how blessed the people of his kingdom, how blessed Israel was as well. Scripture tells us that Solomon, in trying to understand how much he had, Scripture tells us that yearly Solomon had an incoming weight of gold that measured at 666 talents, which is worth over $1 billion in today's terms. He received that yearly. I heard some grunts like that. Now, when you think about it, that number, it doesn't even include his housing that we see there in the third through the 10th verse. It doesn't include the furnishing of his housing. It includes nothing about the temples. It doesn't include anything about the stable of horses that he had, nor the cattle of his field, which he said was greater than any who had come before him. Any who was living at that time. Solomon's kingdom, it was so wealthy that we we're told in the 10th chapter of first Kings that silver, it was coming in Jerusalem as stones. That's how wealthy Solomon was. You know, according to the doctrine of the world, the world would say, people today would say, that y'all grunted, they would say, man, Solomon was blessed. Because that's what it means to be blessed in the world today. Having many materials. Having the riches of the world. When you have the riches of the world, people will look at you and say, man, you are blessed. And they don't even know the first thing about being blessed. See, all the earth would come bearing gifts to Solomon just to hear his wisdom so that they could learn how to be rich like he was, so that they could gain great wealth like he did. That reminds me of how people are today. We go out and we get the books of all of those who are rich and wealthy because we want to gain the riches of this world, don't we? We go out and we try to mimic them, do everything that they did because they made it. And if they made it by doing those things, we believe that we can make it as well. How many of us seek the Lord today in his riches? Oh. See, people truly believe today that the blessing, the blessing of great wealth is all that they need. And if they have all of those riches, they have the blessing and they therefore will be happy. With that in mind, I feel like we need to look at the other side of Solomon's story. Because you see, on the other side of Solomon's story, there's a turn. And it wasn't for the good, I want you to understand today. Solomon, he had everything. Solomon, he had great wealth. But in the great wealth came a great fall. Solomon, scripture shows us that he began to fall in love with the world. And in falling in love with the world and its riches, he began to live for the world and its riches. In other words, Solomon, he began to live in submission, in total submission for the world. Solomon, he again, we are told here in the third verse that he searched how to gratify his flesh with wine while guiding his heart with wisdom for how to lay hold of folly, that is foolishness. 
Solomon, he desired to see what was good under heaven. Good, I will use air quotes for that. You see, Solomon, he was trying to find the meaning of life, trying to find happiness through worldly living, not living in submission to God, but living again in submission to the world. Do you think that you can find happiness through worldly living? That was the question that Solomon sought to answer. And he did some research on it. Boy, that's Solomon. He really gave in to the research on this living for the world, which again, it reminds me of something that, that Jesus has said. Jesus, he said that it is impossible for you to live for two masters. You can't live in submission of two masters. The two masters being one God, the second being mammon, which is the riches of this world. You can't live for the riches of this world and live for God at the same time. Jesus said that it is impossible because you'll begin to despise the one while loving the other. And oftentimes when you live for the riches of this world, you begin to love the riches of this world while despising God altogether. Now in his dabbling in worldly living, which one do you think that Solomon gave in to? Did he give in to submission of the Lord or did he give in to submission to the world? We are told here in this passage of scripture that Solomon, he continued to add on to his wealth said that, Solomon, again, he was greater than all of those who had come before him. Again, over in first Kings and the 11th chapter of first Kings. Scripture tells us that Solomon, he married not just one time. He married again. He married again. He married some 697 other times. If you do the math on that. Y'all laugh at that. Solomon, he shook her head. Solomon, he had over 700 wives and princesses, 300 concubines Solomon had. Solomon scripture tells us that he clung to them in love. And in that love, he stopped being loyal to the Lord. He gave in submission to the world. In other words, he gave in to worldly living. Again, Solomon, I want you to understand he sought happiness. Solomon, I want you to understand that he was seeking the meaning of life. How many of us today live thinking that if we were to have all the women and all the men of the world, that we would find the meaning of life? Again, many of us, we, we seek the riches of the world and think that we can find the meaning of life, that we will have everything, that we will prosper. Solomon, he didn't stop there. Scripture tells us that he built shrines and images for his wives. He built temples for them to be able to, to burn incense and make sacrifices to their gods. And Solomon, he joined in with them. Again, Solomon tells us there in the ninth verse, there in the second chapter of Ecclesiastes, that he excelled more than anybody that came before him. But then we get to the sad part. And doing all of these things in order to find happiness through worldly living, the Lord became angry with Solomon. This is how God feels about worldly living. The Lord, I want you to understand today that he's not pleased by worldly living. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had been turned away from him. God, he promised to tear the kingdom away from Solomon, from his house after his days were over. While Solomon lived the rest of his days, they were filled with much adversity. Again, Solomon was born to be a man of peace, a man of rest. Had he been faithful, the Lord had promised him long life. But Solomon, in his wickedness, in his worldly living, found that his days were shortened. 
He didn't live longer than his dad had lived. In his latter days, Solomon, he looked back over his life. He looked back on his worldly living, as we see here in my key verse for today. And Solomon, I just feel like we need to pay very close attention. I feel that so many eyes need to see this today. Solomon said, the labor in which I toiled, that labor was worldly living. Solomon said, all was vanity. Solomon said that all was grasping for the wind. Solomon, he said that there was no profit under the sun. There was no profit in all of the things that many people would be going, oh man, Solomon, you did great. Solomon, you got all the riches of the world. They'd be doing like this to Solomon. And that one billion that he was pulling in a year, boy, folks would be going, oh, I want to be just like Solomon. Solomon looked at them at his latter days and said, man, it was pointless. Solomon said it was vanity. It was meaningless. Solomon said that it was not profiting to me. There was no profit. He had all the riches of this world. Solomon had everything that a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl could want. And he said there was no profit. I think about how when I was little and I was in preschool, I remember we was probably about three years old. And a preschool teacher would be saying, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the little kids, all of us would say, well, we want money. We want to be rich. It was ingrained within us at an early age, that worldly doctrine of greed, of covetousness, of jealousy. It was ingrained in us at an early age to where many of us now, now today, we still think like a little child. Greedy, wanting the riches of this world when the riches of this world ain't did a thing for our soul. I don't think you hear me here today. You see, what it said here in, in the key verse, along with, with how I was raised, it, I want you to understand that it has actually shaped my outlook on living. It has shaped my outlook on life itself. My brother and my mom, they'll testify to you right now that I'm not one that cares about money. I don't care about it. Yeah, it helped me get the things that I need, but I don't have to have it. Y'all have heard me say that before. And many people won't believe it, but I walk around in a pair of shoes that my brother got me for Christmas in 2016, still to this day. That's just how I am. The car that's sitting outside right now, I got that in 2007. That's just how I am. I don't have to have a fancy car. I don't have to have fancy clothes. I don't have to have a mansion. This world, it is passing away. You see, I live for the world that ain't passing away. I don't know about you. You see, I live for the kingdom of heaven. I lay up my treasures in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus told me, don't lay up my treasures here in this world where it can be destroyed, where it can be stolen. That's what Jesus told me. And I'm obedient to that. Because again, as Solomon said here, it's vanity to live for this world. It is meaningless to live for the riches of this world. We'll see there that Solomon, a man that had everything, everything that a man could could dream of. He I want you to understand was trying to find joy. But he said in his world of living, trying to find joy was like grasping for the wind. He couldn't do it. He came up empty in his search. Solomon, he concluded We'll see there in the 17th verse here in the second chapter of Ecclesiastes that he concluded that he hated life. Look at the wording there. He said that he hated life because the labor for happiness through worldly living, it was distressing. Some, some are able to, to, to get the riches of this world, but the rest, they are stressed out over the riches of this world because they can't gain. 
And this was a man that had everything who said that world of living was distressing and vanity. Now, why did he keep saying that it was vanity? Why did he keep saying that it was meaningless? He kept saying that it was vanity. He kept saying that it was meaningless because he could not find a joy in the world. And I tell you, so many of us need to hear that today. You can't find contentment through worldly living. Let me repeat one more time for you today. You can't find contentment through worldly living. As Solomon said in the opening chapter of Ecclesiastes, the eye is never satisfied with seeing if you live for the world. In other words, lust, they are never quenched. You're always lusting and lusting and lusting. You're always trying to add more and more and more. Solomon, he hated worldly living even more because his labor, he says there in the 18th and the 19th verse, he said that his hard labor would not be completed. It will be left for someone else who may actually be wise, but there's a chance that they may actually be a fool as well. Ultimately, in my key verse for today, Solomon said that he looked at the labor in which he had toiled, in which he had toiled through worldly living, and found again that there was no gain. And that was the part that hurted him most that through worldly living, he wasn't living a fruitful life. He wasn't living a fruitful life for his soul and for the souls of all of those that were around him as well. Even though he had many worldly riches, he said it did nothing for his heart and it didn't do anything for the hearts of all of those that are that were around him. Vanity of vanities, he said. Vanity of vanities, all his vanities is how he actually opened up this book of Ecclesiastes in the first chapter, the second verse. If a man that had all the riches of this world would say that, shouldn't it make you wonder? Shouldn't it make you wonder about gaining and grinding and hustling for the riches of this world? Again, I ask you today, why are you so obsessed if you are? Why are you so obsessed with the riches of this world? Why are you grinding and hustling for the riches of this world if it is no profit for your soul? Here again is where I remind you that all the devil has to offer to anybody is again the riches of this world. Many today live in submission to his doctrine. Many live in submission to the doctrine of greed, the doctrine of lust, the doctrine of covetousness, the doctrine of great gain. But again, the sad part about all of this is that so many of us have been fooled to believe that your life is pointless if you don't gain. Many of us, we have been fooled to believe that we are nothing because we don't have the riches of this world, because our bank account doesn't have a million in it, or doesn't have hundreds of thousands in it, or tens of thousands in it, we've been told that we are nothing because we don't have the world. But Jesus, he again, he taught that it is pointless to live in submission to the world, because again, worldly riches can be stolen, and because worldly riches will fade away. Don't live for the world today. That is not the meaning of life. And I consider the grind and the hustle of so many that live for the riches of the world today. And I consider what it has done for their soul. Jesus asked the question, you know, if you could gain the riches of the world, but lose your soul, what is the point? So many of us, we have lost our soul. We are a shell of what we could be. God, I want you to understand today, he did not plant you in this field to be fruitless. In other words, I want you to understand today that God, he did not plant you in this world to not bear any fruit in the world. See, some of us, we go out, we try to gain the riches of this world. And again, some of us, we gain the riches, but we don't stop. We are greedy. We have to add more and more and more. 
many that have gained riches and end up uh, gaining those riches, they end up being miserable in their life because they haven't found what they thought that they would find. And then all of those ones that go out and they try to gain the riches of the world and they don't. They are left depressed in their soul. They're left in despair in their soul because they didn't gain what they believed that they should have gained, which was the riches of this world. I think about how hard my dad, how he labored in his life from the time he was just a boy from picking peaches to the time where he was working in warehouses for for Siemens. And I think about how once he was able to retire from his labor in the world, how he couldn't even really enjoy his retirement because he passed away soon after he retired. And and, and that hurt me because I know that my dad was such a, a hard labor working for the man, as we often say. But I thank God today that my dad found him. Because you see, my dad had another labor, a labor which was far greater than laboring for the man. Yes, my dad and my mom, they was able to put food on the table for, for me and my brother. They was able to put a roof over our heads. We had the clothes that we wanted, the shoes on our feet that we wanted. We had all the game consoles that we could want. We was able to play in the band as we wanted. But again, I tell you that my dad had an even greater labor because I can remember the vacation Bible schools that we used to have and how the church was filled with nothing but young folks. We can't get young folks to even come out to the church today. But my dad, he had it. He put so many folks on the path of the way. He put so many folks on the path of the truth. He put so many folks on the path of the life, if you get what I mean by that. And so I will tell you that people like him have lived a fruitful life when it is all said and done. They may not have had silver and gold in this world, but they had the silver and gold that is of the Lord. They had the treasures of heaven. That is what life is all about. Are you living to uplift today? Are you living to save souls today? Are you being fruitful in your life? Are you living a life of purpose? God, again, I want you to understand that he has not put us in the world to live a pointless life. He has not put us in the world to live a meaningless life. He put us here to live a life of meaning. And he has shown us how to go about living a life of meaning. He has shown us how to be fruitful. He has shown us how we are to bear that holy and righteous fruit so that we can profit not just our soul, but so that we can profit all the souls that are around us. In conclusion, Solomon, I want you to understand, after all of his research in worldly living, after he said that living through the world and for the world was pointless, Solomon, he called on us to remember our creator. In the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes, as we come to our close here, we'll see there in the first verse that he called on us to remember our creator in the days of our youth. Solomon, he advised us to learn to have no pleasure in living for the world, have no pleasure living in worldly living, have no pleasure in temporary happiness, because one day God, Solomon said in the fifth verse there in the 12th chapter, God will judge us. As I said earlier in this series of sermons that I have preached, the harvest of God, it is coming. It is drawing near as the Lord is coming for his fruit. And I want you to understand today that God's fruit is not the riches of this world. God's fruit is holy and righteous fruit. That is the fruit that the Lord desires to harvest. Solomon in the sixth verse there, he called us on, on us again to remember our creator before the silver cord is loosed, before we get old. For again, the very same reason, the day of the Lord is at hand. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess what we have done in this world. Whether we live the life of meaning or not, whether we live a life of purpose or not. I call on you today to live a fruitful life. 
Let the word of God take root in you so that you can bear the holy and righteous fruit. If you don't know the meaning of life, I tell you today, go to the word of God. God, he has not hidden it from you. The Lord tells you to believe in his only begotten son so that you don't perish, but have everlasting life. And then the Lord tells us to do good according to what he has said is good. And again, in closing, what he has said is good is to be fair with each other. Again, what he said is good is to love mercy. And again, what the Lord has said is good is for us to uplift each other in the way in which we ought to go. And that way is to live for him. Will you be fruitful after hearing this today? Will you live a life of meaning after hearing this today? I hope your answer to that question is, I will, Pastor, I will. Amen. 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 Amen.